Is he a dictator or not? Now, yes, of course he is. He is. He's not a democrat. Uh, he, he doesn't bother about the parliament. He doesn't bother about center state relations. He doesn't bother about the office of the uh, president of India. He doesn't bother about uh, in, anybody in the, in the in the in the in the government. And you know, he 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 can he can he is no more what he used to be in 2014. A team India, which is prime minister and the chief ministers. It so is your answer to my question is Narendra Modi a dictator? Was of course he's a dictator. Yes. He has set India back in terms of economy at least 20 years to 25 years. In terms of polity, at least he has taken us back to pre-independence days. In terms of uh, social fabric and, you know, scientific temper and the values of the society, of secularism, of, you know, India belonging to everybody, he has taken us back to the days of 1818 or even before that. Or even to the Middle Ages. A return to power of this present government with this kind of a narrative, with this kind of a track record, current it would spell disaster. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Could Narendra Modi end up losing the forthcoming elections? And if the answer is yes, what is the explanation? On the other hand, could Narendra Modi also end up with a sweeping majority? If the answer is yes, what would be the likely impact on India's politics as well as its democracy? Those are the key issues I should explore today with the well-known author, economist and commentator, Parakala Prabhakar. Dr. Parakala is also the husband of Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman. Dr. Parakala, whilst Narendra Modi boasts that the BJP will get 370 seats and the NDA will cross 400, in interviews that you've recently done with Deepak Sharma and Nilu Vyas, you said that Narendra Modi and the BJP will struggle to get to 220 to 30 seats. Can you start by explaining what brings you to this conclusion? Karan, thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure speaking to you. Um, you know, um, let, let me break it down into two parts. The first part is that I think uh, 370 and 400 par is just a very, very intelligent trick played by the ruling party and the prime minister. I'll tell you why. One, if they have not said that, the debate in the country would have been whether they're going to return to power or not, whether they're going to win this election or not. Now the debate, because they have said that, the debate now is whether they'll be, it is possible for them to win 370 or is it possible for the NDA to cross 400. So it is, it is shifting of the terms of debate that they've achieved by boasting that they would cross 370 or they, would, they will win 370 and they would cross uh, 400. Now, my uh, uh, estimate why the BJP, the ruling party under Mr. Narendra Modi, will struggle to get 220, 230 is as follows. 
um you know in still about 2014 the bjp at its peak was able to get hold of about 20 22% and not more than that i'm not talking about the allies and you know nda and, and all that and in 2014 they rode a very popular wave which was launched by the india against corruption and because of that a lot of middle class urban professionals they were disgusted with the corruption that was going on or what perceived corruption that was going on and then you know the strong marketing of gujarat model strong leader decisive no policy paralysis kind of a narrative also fetched them the additional thing and that has taken them to about 27% or so and i'm not talking about you have to um, see that you know the allies votes are not counted here but just the bharatiya janata party now in 2019 Balakot and you know other uh, things, uh, Pulwama, they have added a bit more. But now I have come to this uh, estimate, especially after what 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 is called the Modi Gate, the 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 electoral bond uh, scheme, the kind of scandal that is now you know current. It's very difficult for many people to really you know, get an estimate, get an understanding of how fast it is penetrating into the common people. People are talking. They may not know the nuances of electoral bond, but something has happened. You know, a lot of money has changed hands. This narrative has gone very deep into the people. And the most important point here is that the moral high ground on which the Bharati Janta Party and the Narendra Modi government has been standing all this while has collapsed now. Now, when, when this recedes, the 2001, uh, 2014, the accrual that uh, the, the BJP got, if that recedes, then they will back again, be back again to to the 20%, 22%, 23%. So this is one. The, the second thing, if, if you look at the states, of course, we will discuss those uh, states also, but this is the overall logic, the overall framework within which I place my argument. Now, Narendra Modi, as you know, has boasted that the BJP alone will win 370 seats. Yesterday, we checked with the BJP press office and they said we should estimate that they will contest something like 450 seats. If that is what they actually contest, then the aim to win 370 means they're winning 82% of the seats they contest. That is a fantastic strike rate. Would you say that is impossible to achieve? It is impossible. That's what I have been arguing. How many seats do they have to contest? You know, not just the nominal contest, but serious contest that in order for that, for them to win 370. This, if, they, if the strike rate, they're expecting more than 60 or 62% of strike rate, even that is on the higher side, I think they are living in Modi's paradise. In other words, an 82% strike rate is ruled out by you. Possible, Karan. Impossible. It's just not possible. Especially, you know, uh, if you if you if you look at seriously what is happening in the country, we will we'll come to that. You know, we, we, we will see what exactly is the, the situation in the country. Dr. Parakala, if Modi is unlikely to cross 220, 230 seats compared to 303 in 2019, he's presumably going to lose a lot of seats in northern India. Where precisely in northern India do you see the losses taking place? Um, Karan, um, let us see now, first of all, which are the states which have given them a huge support in 14 and 19 too. Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, and of course their home turf, that is Gujarat. The, this is the core area. And this area has reached saturation. Now, I feel, especially after I, I get to know the reports that are coming out, especially from the FMCG uh, companies and the kind of rural distress and other things that we read about and we see. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the mandir has not really taken off. They, they, they pinned a lot of hope on that. Uh, 
If you if you look at these dynamics, then I think in these four or five states, they are losing not less than 50 to 60 seats there itself. You're saying in states like Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Haryana, UP, Bihar, they are losing up to 50, 60 seats out of what they won in 2019. Yes, that, that's a very likely scenario. How do you see Mr. Modi and the BJP's performance in South India? In 2019, he won 29 out of a total of 129 seats. Where do you think he will end up in 2024? Current, the largest chunk of the 29 had come from Karnataka. And Telangana gave only about four seats. Now, in Telangana, they, they, will, be, they will be much down. They will be down probably uh, to about two. Uh, but you see, they will compensate those two in Andhra Pradesh because now they are uh, teamed up with the uh, Telugu Desham Party. Otherwise, they they wouldn't they would have drawn a blank in in Andhra Pradesh. They they probably would win about two or three from Andhra Pradesh. But Karnataka, they are going to suffer a, a huge setback because you see, in in Karnataka, their entire strength, even 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 as evidenced by the. The, the recently concluded last year's uh, assembly elections also, their strength mainly came from the coastal Karnataka and Bangalore and the surrounding areas. Now, these two areas too are very, very distant from very tough for, for the BJP now. So how many seats do you think they lose in Karnataka? I, I think they, they had virtually all the seats, barring one or two. How many yeah. will they lose? They, they, they just lost three seats last time. I think uh, th this time from 25 they have, I think uh, it's very difficult for them to cross 15. In other and, words, and they will pick up one or two in Andhra Pradesh, as I said. And, Kerala, words, and Kerala and Tamil Nadu, they are again going to draw a blank. So, in other words, you're anticipating a loss of up to 50, 60 seats in northern India and possibly somewhere between 10 and 13 seats in southern India. That is an overall loss of something like 70 seats altogether, 70, 72, 73 seats, which is why the tally comes down from 303 in 2019 to roughly 230 this time around. Uh, I, I would like to add one more sentence here, uh, Karan. Uh, normally what happens and what many observers ignore is what is called the bandwagon effort, effect. You know, when you, when you start losing 10, when you are poised to lose 10, you might end up losing 12 or 13. You know, that is the bandwagon. So if they are, if they are losing, if they are poised to lose about 50 or 60, they might end up losing 70 to 75. In other words, the bandwagon effect works both ways. When you're gaining, you could gain more than you're expected yes. to gain. When you're if losing, you're to you win 15, lose more. Yes. If you're poised to win 15, you might you might win uh, 20. But if, if you're poised to lose 10, then you might even lose uh, you know, uh, more than uh, uh, 10, 15 or even 13. If Modi and the BJP cannot cross 230, which is 42 seats short of the majority, what sort of government will we have? Are you anticipating an opposition coalition or will Narendra Modi and the BJP be successful in cobbling together a fragile majority of their own? Um, Karan, we'll have to go a little bit into the background because you see the, the, uh, the uh, current uh, ruling coalition Actually, you know, they started talking about NDA only very recently. Otherwise, they were not even talking about the BJP government. They were talking about Modi government. Now, after Modi government, from Modi government, they graduated to BJP government. And from BJP government, they're talking about NDA government. And, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to get everybody on board. Now. So many people are on board. now. Why? Because they're panicking. Now, when when the ruling party is strong, they're anyway going to form the government. A lot of people flock to that. They jump onto the bandwagon. But you see, because of their conduct over the last 10 years, it I mean, you don't see evidence of winning manners. 
by the coalition managers, by the prime minister, by the leadership. They 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 were so aloof and you know they 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 were unfriendly to allies and they, they didn't even bother for a long time. So when that happens, when all this is built up, when they are falling, these so-called allies would like to push them even further rather than coming to their rescue. So are you suggesting that a government is difficult for Mr. Modi to form if he ends up at 230? And, and, you know, I do not see an evidence of the present leadership um, has the skill or the temperament to go and, you know, win allies, strike bargains, give and take. That I do not see any evidence. So I yes. think it's very difficult for them to, you know, stitch together compromises and uh, alliances. So you're saying if Mr. Modi ends up with just 230 seats, he may be the single largest party in the Lok Sabha, but he will be forced to sit in the opposition because he doesn't have the temperament, he doesn't have the skills, he's not behaving in a way that he can stitch together the allies needed to form even a fragile coalition government. Therefore, mm. opposition mm. is where he's headed for. Yeah, nor does his uh, even his team. The team also doesn't have the kind of skills and the kind of... Uh, you know, uh, wherewithal to stitch an alliance and, and strike bargains and compromises. So according to your analysis, Dr. Parakala, Modi is heading for opposition. Uh, that is the most likely scenario that I see, Karan. Yes. Okay. Against that background, let's at this point ask you how you view the Narendra Modi government that's ruled the country for the last 10 years. In your book, The Crooked Timber of New India, you say, and I'm quoting, our democracy is in crisis, our social fabric is torn, our economy is in peril, and we are being dragged back to the dark ages. What is the impact of 10 years of Narendra Modi's rule on India? I stand by every word that I wrote then in my book. And I would like to add one more thing to this, is that, you know, um, India also had, especially after you had uh, the revelations about the electoral bond, I think this is the most corrupt government also in, in, in the history of India. Having said that, let me, uh, let me see, uh, let me tell you what I feel. You know, this, this government, what it did overall, especially to the economy, is from being a fragile five, they have taken us to a country where there are fragile 82 crore people. From fragile 5, we have become fragile 82 crore people. This is one. The second thing is that inequality is so high now that one person, this is the, this is the World Inequality Report uh, lab report, uh, uh, one percent of the population has about 22% of its income and 1% of the population has about 40% of its assets. Now, the philosophy of this government seems to be, you know, give five kilos of uh, food grains to poor people and five airports to my friend. That seems to be the, that, that seems to be the, the philosophy. And, you know, I was shocked, uh, Karan, recently Professor Pangaria, who is one of the important uh, uh, persons in their, in their economic uh, team, um, said, don't lose sleep over inequality. You know, it reminded me of, uh, uh, you know, Gordon Gecko, greed is good, inequality is good. And the chief economic advisor, said somewhere that solving unemployment problem is not the remit of the government. And another economic apparatchik of the regime said there is, there is poverty of ambition among our young people. You know, when, when the youth unemployment rate in this country is 24% and the unemployment rate among young people aged between 20 and 25 is 40%, now we have uh, the mandarins of the regime talking about inequality is good, um, you know, unemployment is not our remit, and you know, it's there's a poverty of uh, of uh, you know ambition, and you know, 
the look at the look at the hundreds and thousands of people who are queuing up to get uh, recruited by israeli government to go to gaza knowing very well it is a risk to their life so sure. this is the kind of uh, that is the kind of uh, you know distress that people are in now this in addition to this you have you know uh, states being squeezed of their legitimate financial uh, um, transfers and then minorities are under threat our democracy is now has become a mockery because you know you you are running the lok sabha without 140 more than 140 opposition mps you suspend them and pass bills you know in terms of handing the economy to come to that specifically in your book you talk of what you call narendra modi's staggering incompetence why do you say that when this year we could be growing at a rate that is just under 8% and when mr modi claims that he's lifted 250 million people out of poverty why do you call that staggering incompetence oh there are there are several difficulties and several problems with this this kind of a methodology that is one the second thing of course the, the most important uh, 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 problem that i must point out very 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 uh, briefly is that when they say that they they were growing at 8% why is this that consumption is only growing at 3 to 3.5% So you don't believe that eight percent figure? No, not at all. Not at all. There, there is a huge problem in this. Now you see, uh, internationally, it is acceptable to have a have a a, a, a variation of about point five percent to one percent between the national income accounts and the national consumption accounts. But here it is about four percent. So, which means I think this figure is so much inflated, so much exaggerated that they're they're trying to make it into a a, a huge, uh, you know, uh, uh, propaganda stuff. But what about the claim of lifting two hundred and fifty million people out of poverty? I, I'll come to that, Karan. the The point is this: the point is that when they say that they were growing at such a high rate of growth, eight percent. why is it that the household savings is at the lowest historical low of 5% why is it that the household debt is at a historic high of 40% not only that even the national debt has grown over the last 10 years by more than 120 lakh crore who is accounting for that now look at this 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 is the the there is there is very interesting uh, um, you know massaging of figures here when you talk about you know so many millions of people who are lifted out of poverty now you see uh, when people talked about per capita income then they said look per capita income probably is, is somewhere it is high but if you don't have access to schooling health care roads infrastructure information all this what is the point so you need to bring in these elements also so therefore this concept of multi dimensional poverty was brought in now here the government of india is playing a trick of you know they are not talking about the income part of it they were talking about you know what is the infrastructure that was created therefore they are saying that you know multi dimensional poverty has come down but then the 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 computing of even these things are having a problem because you know earlier can i can i interrupt you know, just one 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 sentence current earlier One kilometer of a four-lane road used to be one kilometer of a four-lane road. Now, one kilometer of a four-lane road today is four kilometers. So, therefore, when you boost up everything by a factor of about four, and then you see we have brought down the multi-dimensional poverty. Now, it it is it is it's a laughable proposition. So, you're saying to me that this claim that we have lifted two hundred and fifty million people out of poverty hinges around this concept of multi-dimensional poverty, and you're saying the problem with multi-dimensional poverty is it pays more attention not to income levels which are not growing, but to other things like health, education, etc., which are 
misleading at best and you know i want to i want to point out one more puzzle and see what you make of it say for instance uh you know in 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 2014 april the world bank has declared in 2014 april that india has become the third largest economy in 2011 that's on record in all the newspapers have published that now how many times does our government want us to become third largest economy well wow. the second thing is now we claim that we are now the fifth Hold largest on a second when we be, when you claim that the world bank says we became the third largest economy in 2011 is that in purchasing parity terms yes that, that that that's what the world bank had said very clearly and we don't talk about that at all now why so you're saying that the achievement of becoming the fifth largest economy last year is in fact misleading because we were already the third largest i mean we're getting confused over here so i'm asking you for a bit of clarity but briefly because this point will now begin to confuse the audience horribly no is is i think it's the government which is confusing or the government which is confused uh-huh. it, it, the data does not confuse one, one more point let's 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 extricate ourselves from this because i don't want the audience to get confused and lose track on this point this is simply to do with definitions about what is the largest what is the second largest and how it's measured let's get out of that let's focus instead while we talk about the last 10 years of narendra modi's rule on narendra modi himself do you believe over the last 10 years he's shown that he's a dictator or is that an exaggeration no i'll come to that just allow me one sentence um briefly you know, when, when we yeah, are very briefly when you say that we have overtaken the united kingdom and become the fifth largest economy united kingdom is a, is a developed country if you have overtaken a developed country you would have become a developed country are you a developed country but again at the same time oh, the private oh, give me sir we need to be clear over here because we we'll end up horribly confusing the audience we've overtaken the united kingdom in terms of the absolute size of the economy but if you're talking about income per person per capita per head we are, are behind important. them we are 21 22 times behind them they are at 42 43000 dollars per person we are roughly at 2800 so we're around 20 times behind them that is exactly what i'm trying to absolutely. say absolutely but let's extricate ourselves from that because i don't want the audience to get confused and sidetracked let's focus on the 10 years of the modi government by asking the question has he behaved like a dictator in your eyes is narendra modi a dictator as many people say i i feel that he is definitely not a democrat and i think he is on the way to become and he would like to become a dictator because you see the, the, i think there is this uh, forgive me what do you mean he'd like to become is he a dictator or not no yes of course he is he is he's not a democrat um, he he doesn't bother about the parliament he doesn't bother about center state relations he doesn't bother about the office of the uh, president of india he doesn't bother about uh, in anybody in the, in the in the in the in the government and you know he 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 can he can he is no more what he used to be in 2014 a team india which is prime minister and the chief minister so your team. answer to my question is narendra modi a dictator was of course he's a dictator yes in your opinion what will be history's verdict on the 10 years of narendra modi's prime minister i think uh, the verdict would be that he has set india back in terms of economy at least 20 years to 25 years in terms of polity at least he has taken us back to pre independence days in terms of uh, social fabric and you know scientific temper and the values of the society of secularism of you know india belonging to everybody he has taken us back to the days of 1818 or even before that or even to the middle ages i'm going to repeat what you said because i think it's so critical and important you said he has set india back in terms of the economy by 20 25 years in terms of polity to pre independence days in terms of the social fabric he's taken us back to at least 1818 that is two centuries and more yeah I- i- even middle ages 
you know the entire narrative of past worshiping this has become a, the official credo of india under sri narendra modi let's at this point dr parakala flip our discussion so far we've talked about how he's likely to do in the elections and secondly about an assessment of the way his rule has impacted india over the last 10 years now i want to raise a third issue with you let's assume that narendra modi gets a majority and forms a third government when the elections are held starting in a week's time what would that mean a third narendra modi government for india's democracy and for the country you know uh, a return to power of this present government with this kind of a narrative with this kind of a track record current it would spell disaster for india i think you can forget about the kind of uh, diverse liberal secular india we've been talking about we have, we have lived through i i think the the narrative is going to be you know uh, this constitution did not serve us well this is not the constitution that is uh, suitable to india it has to be a country owned and run by the hindus according to their own ancient wisdom and ancient values and ancient texts this is one which is in other words is a, a hindu rashtra so you you are expecting that if he gets a third term he will move to change the constitution and officially make india a hindu rashtra that's what you are expecting that is the project that's what i see and of course that is the reason why they talk about uh, for, for charges of power and all that uh, which is which is unlikely but in the unlikely event of you know they getting what they what they are what they want to get to get is this is what it is going to be and another important thing you know uh, you know uh, probably manipur is is not a very large part of our national imagination but you know what is happening in manipur and you don't get to know of it if you look at any mainstream media you don't get to look at it it is almost like you know you 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 smother um, a, a, a cop and uh, prevent it from heralding dawn and dawn doesn't uh, you know stop it will anyway come but the point is this the point is that they are smothering but that kind of a scenario what is happening in manipur is likely to happen in every state in this country current that is the danger the other danger is you know the the, the kind of dog whistles that you hear lynching and you know economic boycott marking of houses and calling upon people to you know uh, chant this particular uh, slogan or worship in this particular way otherwise you have no place in this country you know these kind of uh, things are now confined here and there to dog whistles by fringe elements but if this government returns i am apprehensive that these kind of dog whistles will no longer be dog whistles but they will be open calls from the ramparts of red fort i got a second you are saying that calls calling muslims babar ki aulad accusing them of love jihad and cattle lynching telling them to go to pakistan even calls by dharm sansads threatening genocide and ethnic cleansing you are saying these will now be heard from the ramparts of the red fort in other That's words the prime minister on independence day will be saying these things if mr modi wins a third term that's what you're saying exactly you know you had a foretaste of that because a, a couple of years ago the prime minister uh, had said you know uh, 14th of august should be celebrated as partition horrors day so and you know you could only expect some kind of a logical progression from there that is the likely scenario, likely scenario that you know so I then would... let me ask you bluntly muslims are 14.3% of our population now estimated to be around 200 million that is bigger than the population of any muslim country other than indonesia and possibly pakistan it's bigger than the population of most countries anywhere in the world 
What sort of future do Indian Muslims face if Narendra Modi wins a third term? You know, the, the, there's this classic formulation of, uh, you know, um, 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 what do we, how do we deal with the Muslim question has been uh, debated for a long time within uh, the, the Sangpara organizations, you know that. But in it, the, the present is Tiraskar. Parishkar, Tiraskar, uh, uh, you know, you 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 give them a, a lot of uh, uh, saman. So leaving all those, now we have come to a tiraskar issue. What does tiraskar mean? Tiraskar means rejection. Now you see, you see what is happening now. So you are saying we will be rejecting Muslims. See, it's already there. I I just want to point out two or three signals uh, current to you. This is the first ever time the largest minority of this country has no place in the Union Cabinet and Union Council of Ministers. This is the first ever time that the largest minority of this country does not form the, does not does not have a place in the ruling parties, uh, legislature parties in many states as well as the central legislature party. In fact, in the BJP one. doesn't have a single Muslim MP in either House of Parliament. Yes. And in many states where they rule, like for instance, Uttar Pradesh and Gujarat for a long time, even, even in, 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 in a place like Karnataka, not only they, they don't have a, a member in their legislature party, but they have not even been given a ticket. So this is Tiraskar. Puraskar, no Puraskar. You know, uh, Parishkar, we have to, the Parishkar is by Tiraskar. That is what they are doing it, one. So saying, I'm just clarifying for the audience. You can carry on after I've interrupted you. You're saying that the situation facing Muslims is what you call tiraskar, i.e. rejection. They will be rejected by the government. Yes, it's, it's already started. I mean, the, the, the signs are very clear, as I pointed out. One. The second thing, uh, what I'm afraid of, uh, Karan, is this. That if you want to live here, you can very well live. But do accept the superiority of the Hindus. It is, after all, the Hindu land. You, you're welcome to live as long as you accept that you are a subordinate person. You are a subordinate people. This is, this is the first stage. But after, if it continues, after that, even that living in subordination also will not be feasible anymore after some time that, you know, if you have to, uh, you, you, there is no place for you here, you, you can go to, and CAA is... I a, say, are you suggesting that after subordinating Muslims and making them second-class citizens, the second stage after that will be to tell them to leave the country? Is that what you're suggesting? Don't you see that kind of a sign in, in CAA? No, we are now, you know, slowly the the, the first, you know, the, the, the first paw, the so, so to say, is that, you know, you are slowly trying to link citizenship and religion, which was not the case earlier. And, you know, let me... So, so, forgive me, I'm interrupting you, but I'm asked, doing it because I think this is so important. We need clarity. You're saying the first stage after Modi, or if Modi wins a third term, will be subordinating Muslims and making them second-class citizens. And the second stage will be throwing them out of the country. By one method or another, we will throw them out of the country. This will be the completion of Tiraskar, or what you call rejection. Yes, not only to Muslims. I think every other minority in the country will have to live with uh, uh, a situation where they, they have to reconcile to being a subordinate status. You mean Christians as well and Buddhists too? Sikhs too? Why not? Yes. Why not? Because you see, you know, now today you try to co-opt everybody, but that's not the creed. That is not the essential creed. That, that, that has never been the creed. It, and it is no secret, Karan. It's always all, it's written all over. Let me let me sum up what you said because it's a very deeply, distressingly, disturbingly horrible picture that you're painting. You're saying, first of all, India will become a Hindu Rashtra if Modi wins a third term. 
Muslims will be, as you said, rejected or pushed into tiraskar. At the first stage, they will be made subordinate people. Then they will be actually forced to leave the country, if not thrown out of the country. You're saying this could happen to all minorities, Christians, Sikhs, Buddhists. Yes, sir. one after the other. You're guess. saying what is happening in Manipur is likely to happen in every state of the country. This is why you believe, and I'm quoting you, a third term for Modi is, you said, a disaster for India. This is what you mean by disaster for India. Exactly, correct. Exactly, yes. You really mean this? It's a terrible, horrible picture that you've painted. It's worse than hell. But you really mean this? You're not exaggerating. You're not being polemical. You know, you know, I, I don't need to exaggerate. I have no access to grind. I do not have to go after anybody. I do not have to, you know, make a mission of uh, my life to, 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 to criticize somebody or to uh, paint a, a bleak picture. It's not. These are the signs that I see. But if somebody wants to tell me that this is not the case, ask them to show me uh, a, a green shoots in the economy. Ask them to, you know, tell me what is what is the employment scenario. Ask them to tell me, no, you are you are wrong. We have a we have a, a very very respectable uh, Muslim members in the cabinet in the uh, okay. uh, parties. Ask them to tell me. Then tell me. If this is the picture that you see, if Modi wins a third term, what will be his treatment of major regional leaders and chief ministers? What will be the situation facing people like Mamta Banerjee, M.K. Stalin, Arvind Kejriwal, Pinarayi, Vijayan, Akhilesh Yadav? What does the future hold for them? Um, well, you know, uh, today you, you have already had a foretaste of that in in uh, in the case of uh, Mr. Arvind Kejriwal. Whoever differs, whoever doesn't fall in line, or whichever media house is critical or try to question, you know, you know, you know what is happening in the in the in the media. Uh, hang on a second. Are you saying, Dr. Parakala, that just as Arvind Kejriwal and Hemant Soren have been arrested? You're saying the same prospect, the same future looms ahead for Mamta Banerjee, M.K. Stalin, Pinari Vijayan, possibly Akhilesh Yadav. Are you saying jail is the future they face? If they don't fall in line, it's like this. You know, you, you, you're, you're painted as corrupt, but once you join them, you're not corrupt at all. But if they don't fall in line, jail is the alternative? Yes, that, 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 that's what I foresee, yes. You and foresee the entire opposition leadership being sent to jail if they don't fall in line. It's already started. One, two chief ministers are already in jail, and uh, one of the major political parties' uh, uh, bank accounts are frozen. So they 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 are are in such a panic uh, uh, mode that they do not want this election to be a free and fair election. What I mean, about if they are so, so confident, current? Why will they do all this? What about Congress and in particular the Gandhi family? What is the future that stares Rahul Gandhi in the face if Modi wins a third term? Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Jail? Yes, of course. The, 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 the present dispensation doesn't want anybody who would question, who, who would be away from them or who would challenge them. Who would criticize them to be up and about and to be free? Do you believe that Modi will be particularly vengeful to the Gandhi family and perhaps to Rahul Gandhi in particular? Because clearly he doesn't like that family and he particularly dissests Jawaharlal Nehru. So will they be specifically targeted in a way that is, say, worse to the targeting and treatment of people like Mamta Banerjee, M.K. Stalin, Pinari Vijayan? Will their treatment be worse? You know, uh, didn't we get a foretaste of that? Um, Rahul Gandhi especially was uh, uh, thrown out of the uh, Lo uh, Lok Sabha, thrown out of his house. And then the, um, he, he came back after the court intervention. So that is the foretaste. Tell me something. Is this simply the doing of Narendra Modi and possibly Amit Shah, who he's very close to? Or do you think the government as a whole supports this, endorses it and stands by him? 
Or are they just silent because they are scared to speak out? Which of the two? You know, uh, the, the thing is this. It's very difficult to, you know, uh, get into, you know, uh, personalities. And I'm not asking you to get into personalities. I'm deliberately avoiding naming your wife. I'm simply saying, do you think the government as a whole stands the... by Modi? Or is Modi doing something that he wants to do without caring about what his government and his party thinks? I think it is the, it is the project of the present dispensation. It is the project. It is the larger project of making India, or remaking India, in the image of what has been what has been said since the nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties. In other words, the entire government is behind this. Now it is, and the now, party too, and the party too. Yes. Now, now, what what, what is BJP now? In other yeah. words, there are no strong dissenting, differing voices that matter. I, I, do, not, I do not know, Karan. I, I am not privy to any information of that kind. In your, interview, in your interviews with Deepak Sharma and Neelu Vyas, you also said that if Modi wins in 2024, it's likely to be the last election held in India. Do you really mean that the one election that starts in a week from today would end up being the last election? If Modi wins? You know, um, you might have elections like we have elections. You, they have elections in uh, Russia under Putin. Farcical ones? Yeah, farcical ones. 95, 98% people endorsing, you know, uh, just about to. And in China, you have elections. You know, I, I, I met a Chinese delegation when I was the part of uh, AP government. The, the Chinese delegation came and their presentation, the first sentence that they spoke, the leader of the delegation said, China is a multi-party democracy. That's what you're saying. saying to me that if Modi wins in 2024, that election will be the last credible election. We yes. may have elections thereafter, like Putin has in Russia, where he awards himself a majority of 90, 95, 96, 97 percent. But the last credible, free, democratic election, if Modi wins, will have been 2024. That's right. That's what I mean. Yes. How long will this horrible picture that you painted last? Is it reversible? And I'll tell you why I ask. We went through an equally gloomy black patch for roughly 21 months during the emergency that lasted from 75 till early 77. But we recovered, we survived, and we won back our democracy. Is the picture that you're painting that will emerge if Modi wins a third term irreversible? Or can it be reversed and can we emerge back into the sunlight? Um, Karan, I am not somebody who believes in inevitabilism. I believe in human agency. And as I said, uh, uh, the present dispensation returning to power is very unlikely, as I said that. But you asked me if it were to return, what would be the picture? So that's what I have explained. Uh, and is that picture reversible? If at all, if at all that happens, you mean? Yes. Or uh, if it if, all that happens, if it all that happens, can it be reversed at some point it, down the road? It'll be it'll be a long struggle. Now there is a, there is a difference between uh, seventy seven and uh, seventy five and seventy seven, and uh, what is happening now? You know what is happening now is a is part of a project. It is not uh, an an individual ambition or an individual quirk or in an individual uh, uh, or what you call an idiosyncratic uh, thing. It is it is it is a res what is happening now is a result of a project. The project is that to convert this country into a Hindu Rashtra, where other than Hindus have no place. Three, mm -hmm. it should not be it should not be a federation anymore. You know, the, these are the very important narratives. What you're saying, Dr. Parakala, is that the big difference between the emergency and today is that in the days of the emergency, it was Indira Gandhi's personal ambition to secure her position for which she was prepared to sacrifice the constitution and our democracy. But because it was one woman and her interests, it was more easily reversible. Now it is a project a project to which the government, the BJP, the party, the whole entire Sangh Parivar is committed. And the project is not simply 
boosting the glory of an individual. It's converting into a, India into a Hindu Rashtra and doing away with its federalism. And that project, if it were to happen after the third election and the third victory, maybe it's much more, deep. more difficult to reverse. It's much more deep. And, you know, it has the, an ideological underpinning. Like I said, you know, they 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 not only tolerate in, uh, inequality, economic inequality, but even communal inequality, religious inequality, regional inequality, linguistic inequality, food inequality, dress inequality. They justify it. They 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 work for it. This is one. In, in other words, the deep. You're saying the deep dark black night that could descend upon India if Modi wins a third term. Maybe very difficult to reverse. Sunlight would be a long, long, long way ahead. It won't be that easy. It won't be like the emergency that lasted only 21 months. It could last for a lot, lot longer. I'm afraid so, Karan. Yes. On that very depressing note, Dr. Parakala, thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you very much for sharing your analysis of what you believe will be the likely election result. The good news is that you don't believe Narendra Modi is going to get more than 220, 230 seats. You believe that at that level, he find it impossible to form a government, even to cobble together a fragile one. Opposition, as you said, is what stares him in the face. The bad news is that if Narendra Modi wins a majority, as many people, if not most, expect, you believe it will be a disaster for India. I won't repeat the details of that disaster, they're just too depressing to have to hear again. I thank you for making time for me. Take care. And in particular, stay safe. Thank you, Karan. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.